Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So first big event is in the record books. What are we seeing with uh, this this new set? Throne of Eldraine standard. Well, I mean, we talked last week about uh, that first, uh, you know, the first online, like the first league decks, and already we're seeing an evolution of the metagame. You know, like we had seen the Doom Foretold stuff, and I mean, this week was definitely all about ramp. The It's not just that, uh, the like, obviously, Golos was super popular and in, like, four different decks and so on, but, like... Uh, ramp was like 80% of the day two metagame. And the top eight was first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, ninth, all the same deck. So like even the fact the fact that there's already same, like same similar macro archetypes, right? Like there were I think three different decks in the top four. Sort of. Sort of. If you consider them different decks, right? Like uh but the that's in the the team open. The classic was a Ooh. little bit more varied. Very very right? different. Very very different. Like final table in the classic, I think, relative to the to the main event. Oh, definitely, definitely. The classic actually kind of tells a very different story. So I think that it's really hard to have a lot of confidence that we know what the pictures like. Um, but either way, there's a lot to talk about because uh, the decks. Definitely, um, some of the decks from this past weekend show how much you can't just throw cards together. Like, the context for this set is so different than it was six months ago, four months ago. D- the The sort of rules of engagement are different. And uh, I think that nowhere is that more clear than with Bant Ramp. Um, and all these different variations, Bant Ramp or Soul Tie, which Ramp, which is kind of the same thing, but like with a different support suit uh, suite. And then uh, like these Fires of Invention decks, it's interesting because most of them were like Jeskai Planeswalker decks, but the highest finishing one in the hands of Jerry uh, Bertarioni was uh, actually like the Ramp deck. It just used the Fires of Invention Fay of Wishes engine. Yeah, so uh, that version of the Golos deck is kind of it's kind of supposed to beat the mirror match. I think is what they were what they were going for. So it had like fewer irrelevant cards, like no arboreal grazers. Like so, it's a little bit slower to come out. But it's okay if it's a little slower to come out because if you just land that fires of invention, say on turn four or even turn three with a growth spiral. It's on. It's. I think it's hilarious. I think that one of the things we were talking about when we first saw that card, I was just like, man, I just want to land a Fire's Invention and then play a free Circuitous Route. This deck can do that. Um, one of the things that's crazy about this Fire's Invention deck with Circuitous Route, Growth Spiral, Beanstalk Giant, etc., is that where the Jess guy control Fire's Invention decks kind of topped up on how many lands they ever needed to have in play, so incremental lands you could just use to bounce your Fey around. This deck actually wants to keep hitting its land drops because it's a four field of the dead deck, and so hitting land drops like land drop 21 is going to still be getting you value. Yeah, and that's to say nothing of uh, Kenrith the Returned King being used as, like being able to activate it. Or the fact that Hydroid Crassus, you have to actually spend the mana. You see, when you just play with Fires of Invention, that you may like the the casting the card for free. It's uh, it's an alternate but optional cost. If you do it with Hydroid Crassus, it'll just die and be a zero zero. So you still want to spend your mana on stuff. Hydroid Crassus drawing X cards. That's fantastic when you can follow it up with another heavy hitter in that same turn. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's cool play pattern um, sequences in this deck that, that are not available in a lot of other decks. Like, for example, you can, just on this topic of paying for Hydroid Crassus, you can have a Fires of Invention in play, use Fey of Wishes to wish for Planar Cleansing, for example, Cast Planar Cleansing for free. Now, you've cast a free Fae of Wishes and a free Planar Cleansing. You've now removed your own Fire's Invention from the battlefield, which 
removes its, you can only play two cards per turn, and you haven't spent any mana yet. So all your mana can now go into the Crassus, and then you reload. Uh, like, isn't that, that's, that's pretty cool, right? Like, if you're behind on the battlefield, except for purposes of having a Fires of Invention in play, I think that's a really cool thing that you can kind of one, two, three, reload. You've got the biggest thing left, and you probably just drew another Fires of Invention. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot of tactical applications um, and a lot of lines of play. There's also a lot of room for customization because it's not like everybody's just using the same 15-card cyborg with these decks. Or, I uh, mean, the, the, the same stuff to win the game, right? So I think that it's worth pointing out, you talked about Kenrith the Returned King a little bit. So this was a card that was played in... Uh, I think three of the top four lists, either as a one of or a two of, not in the, quote, the Sultai version of the deck, but was played in the Fires deck as well as, quote, the Bant versions of the deck. And they're all five-color decks, right? Like, all these decks need to be able to produce now, all sort five Sort of. Colors. I mean, the Golos decks, yeah. But, like, I think that Kenrith is a really important thing that was not really, like, industry staple. Like, it was, like, a known card, but it wasn't everywhere. Like, there are decks elsewhere in, in you know, Day 2 that are of similar structure that don't play Kenrith. But I think it's important that they have a card to make their deck faster for the mirror matches. And also, not for nothing, this card is, like, Zakama, isn't it? Like, do you remember, like, when there was, like, that Nasif Naya ramp deck that was playing, like, Circuitous Route and then just topping up on gigantic like eight and nine casting cost worms and dinosaurs and zakama was the top end this card is like basically zakama right except for only five mana it's 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 fantastic i think that the ability to uh one shot kill against sorcery speed sweepers is uh attractive i think that the health i think just being able to gain extra life from this card yeah is an unbelievable option that's like the one that is most interesting to me and then there's this uh you put it into play and then you get to put golos from your graveyard onto the battlefield um one of the things that's really important with this is whether it's from the battlefield or from exile is if you cast beanstalk giant with kenrith the return king in play you can activate the red ability. And if you activate the red ability, it's a weird combination. The red ability, uh, uh, it's only R, right? It's cheap. Like the other ones cost two or three mana or five mana to, to activate. All creatures gain trample and haste until end of turn. So you're giving Beanstalk Giant haste, which is pretty cool. But it also has trample, and the Beanstalk Giant is going to be north of 7-7. Seven, seven. So I think one of the main ways that this deck is is closing out games is just deploying a beanstalk giant that can trample over opposing two, two zombies. Sure. Sure. Uh, the, the sideboard here, um, I think warrants some discussion most particularly about agent of treachery, which I think is just such a fantastic card in this format. Yep. The fact that agent of treachery can steal whatever permanent, and then it's actually just like a permanent theft is actually really a, that's a pretty big thing. Like, even, like, the fact that Asian and Treachery isn't just thwarted by some other disenchant type thing makes it so that you can get into these scenarios where you just Asian of Treachery your opponent's fire of his, fires of invention. Yeah, I actually, that, whatever. that's actually what happened in the finals, I think. Right. That the opponent took um, the this deck's fires of invention and then used it to go off. Uh, this The thing about this sideboard is there are, I believe, 14 unique spells in the sideboard. There's two copies of Agent of Treachery, one copy of everything else. And it's like this deck like never sideboards. Uh, the Agents of Treachery come in in matchups where Deafening Clarion isn't good. And for the well, most no, part... Well, no, it sideboards a little. The key is the fact that you've got a bunch of Planeswalkers. Some of these you can actually cast, right? Like, it's you might sideboard out that main deck Time Wipe or those Deafening Clarions, Right. Yep. And all you'd have to do is be able to board in some cards that do anything. And so it may be the case that you're like, uh, actually, I'm in for boarding in a shared summons and a Tamiyo because they're just like card advantage engines, you know? You could. You could. Well, you're going to normally, I think, because there's just a lot of people that you don't want Definite Clarion against. But normally, it's, liter it's, it's almost entirely just those four cards that are in flux. Yeah, but I think that, like, even the decks that you don't want Deafening Clarion against usually have 2-2 two, two zombies. Like, that's the... I think yeah, that's but you're the still going to board it out. It. 
Um, yeah, you could. Uh, I mean, certainly Agent of Treachery, I think, is going to spend the most time in the main deck out of the sideboard cards. Um, and it, you, you're just always going to want, like, because there's one time wipe in the sideboard, one planar cleansing in the sideboard. I think that you're going to want to have at, and at one, one definite clearing on the sideboard. You, I think you're going to always want to have, you know, some sweeper in the sideboard so that you can get it with oh, totally. wishes. Like, I think that you're almost never going to be siding planar cleansing in, right? Like, if you're going to side in a, a sweeper, no. it's not going to be that one. No. No, I'm not talking about sideboarding in sweepers. I'm talking about sideboarding out sweepers. Sure. And then just boarding in some of these card advantage threats. How cool is some chance? Some of the ones that are castable. Chance for glory in the sideboard. That's I exciting. like it. I like it. So chance for glory is that uh, Final Fortune variant. You know, it's a one red white instant creatures you control gain indestructible. Take an extra turn after this one at the beginning of the end step. You lose the game. So at that end step, you know. Notably, Chance for Glory is actually worse in that once you have Fires of Invention, it's not like you can even, like, cast it at instant speed, right? Like, you sort of do, but you don't really because Fires of Invention, you can only play cards on your turn. So, like, it's not like you're responding to your opponent's sweeper with it. You're just in, almost entirely (laughs) just in... You're almost entirely just in for take an extra turn. Yeah, you're, you're Notably, in for the though, final fortune, can, I think. But but you can deafen and clarion. You see, when you deafen and cl- say you got a lot of zombies, they got a lot of zombies. Or even better, you got a lot of zombies, but they got a lot of three threes because they've been okoing you. Right? So you could actually sweep the board of all the oko three threes, and then your two twos can actually still live. And sure. then you take an extra turn and hit him again. So if you have, you know, you just have five tutus and that's 20. So I, I think that there's a there's a play that you can make because this is an instant. And Fires of Invention says you can only cast spells during your turn, but not at sorcery speed, right? So, for example... That's what I said, sort of. Like, I think that a common thing that you might do is, like, you've got a lot of tutus, they've got a lot of tutus... You swing with a bunch of 2-2s, they make just parity blocks, right? And then you're kind of Fae of Wishes, Chance for Glory, and then your guys live, their guys die, you get another turn, and then you win with the next crack back. I, th- I think that's the idea, anyway. Um, well, sort of. You have to have. Crack. You already have to have done the Fae of Wishes. Just, I mean, obviously, Fae of Wishes is still sorcery speed, but... But yeah, the if you already fay of wishes yeah. for it, so that you could just chance for glory in the middle of your turn as your second spell. Yes, yeah, so that's that's not something you're going to easily be doing during combat. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I don't know, man. It, it, we talked about this deck before, um, but it's sort of gotten even progressively more over the top and weirder. Some of the stuff's just becoming super standard, like casualties of war, just in lots of places, right? I'm in love with this card. It's it's just it's a great card to have access to if you don't actually have to have the mana for it. <laughs> well, this card, I mean, this deck would have trouble casting this card legitimately, right? Uh, could it as a Golgari Guildgate? And, oh yeah, you could do it. Swamp uh, and a swamp. Yeah, you could do it. It's oh yeah, it's doable. It's not easy. No, no, but what is? Uh, I I think the uh, shared summons warrants conversation. I'm curious Ooh. your thoughts on this. You know, the whole Fae of Wishes, I'm going to get shared summons, and you can shared summons and go get Fae of Wishes plus something else, like a Crassus or a Golos or a Kenrith, Lamar, whatever you want. Yeah, I think that, like, you can Fae of Wishes for sh- shared summons, and then you could shared summons for, like, you know, Kenrith and Golos or Crassus and Fae of Wishes. I think that the idea is that you're getting um, kind of Fae of Wishes for shared summons for Fae of Wishes and something else. And that uh, that's the like kind of like the double loop situation you can do there. Um, and, you know, at the same time, you're also just creating card advantage, right? Like this is one of the cards that actually puts more cards into your hand. So... Um, that's that's kind of I think what you're supposed to be doing with that card. Uh, it's real flexible. The thing that's I mean bad about it is the wrong term because it's an ex- these are all expensive cards, right? That you're usually relying on having fires of invention on. It's like if you're if you're Fae of Wishesing for shared summons, 
it's not a good play to make if you're behind on the battlefield, right? You're, the chair, that play will basically ensure that you can't get out of being behind. It's certainly an enormous hit to your tempo. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, I, what, one of the things I love about this sideboard, though, is like the Nico Bolas, the Chandra. Like, I think like getting Chandra must be so good a lot of the time in this deck. Uh, both like its combination of defensive abilities, the fact that it can't be countered. And then, you know, I think that the emblems are like an afterthought in this deck, which is weird because I think the emblems are so good generally. Um, but like, that's one of my favorite cards in the sideboard. And sure, the God Eternals is such a cool bullet to get, don't you think? Oh, it seems solid. Um, I, yeah, it seems decent. I, I just, I wonder if you're, if we're really focused enough. Cause like, for instance, do you really want time wipe and planar cleansing and deafening clarion and legions end and Casualties of War, and Chandra Awakened Inferno in your sideboard? That's so many different options at sweeping. Are we really never in the market? I mean, maybe that's just the way you do it. But, like, uh, I don't know. I guess I'm just... Uh, like I'm interested to learn more, but I wonder if this deck might be a little far on the cards to get when you have both Fires of Invention and Fae of Wishes. What's the name of the card that's um, bounce everything? If you bounce four or more things, put something down. Yeah, what about... Like, I think that card might be a card that I would want to have in the sideboard. Because I, I, I echo... Because you your... just want more sweepers. Well, the, it's different, right? Bouncing everything and putting something down is different from destroying everything, right? So, um, it... it it's very one-sided, right? So, for example, if you're way behind on the battlefield and they've got some sort of thing that's beating you up that's not creatures and you're forced to get planar cleansing, you're also in a situation where you're blowing up your own fires of invention. That stinks. Yeah, but right? you're still just putting more cards in your deck that are good when you have both Fae of Wishes and Fires of Invention. So you're saying you want to get things that are good when you only have Fae of Wishes. Is that right. It? I want, like, I wonder if you want to have, like, one or two more of those. You know, like, is there something for the times where you don't have Fires of Invention? Because that seems like it'd be sweet. Well, yeah, I guess if you've got Fires of Invention and Fave Wishes both going, it's like you've already, like, you're already, like, in the driver's seat, seatbelts on, hand on the stick shift, foot on the accelerator. It's not just that you're in the bull position. You know, you're you're already like, rolling. every single thing you're considering once you're in that scenario you have to compare to zero mana casualties of war zero mana <laughs> nico bolas zero mana planar cleansing like the oper- the bar is just so high i'm not saying there aren't gains to be made there i'm just saying that like they no matter how good a stuff you're talking about putting it's not like it's that much better than the stuff that he's got when you're already when everything's coming together well the real question, I think, is what can you do that will be as good as possible? Like, And you don't want to use that many slots in this, but what are the highest impact slots you can use for when you don't already have Fires of Invention? Yeah, I think that the, the Fae of Wishes for Planeswalkers is probably pretty good a lot of the time. Like, if you can... It, can this deck actually legit cast the Dragon God? No, right? It can. No, it can, but it's hard, right? Where, where's it get a third B? You're saying like legit without the fires of invention? Yeah, without without fires of invention. Like yeah, that, that's going to yeah. be tough, I think. Right. So, yeah, I, I think guess that's off the table. But I think like if you could just get, if you just it, what I do think is important is if you just get Tamio, and I think that Tamio is quietly going to be one of the most important cards in the format. I think people forget that Tamio has a static ability. Uh, I, and, like, they think of Tamio as just a card that's helping them for selection and card advantage purposes and recursion purposes. But Tamio also kind of turns off Doom Foretold, right? So if you've got Tamio, they can't make you discard and they can't make you sacrifice. Doesn't that, like, just shut off the entire Doom Foretold deck? I mean, it's not easy to kill with uh, with uh, Oath of Kaya. Hmm. It's interesting. Like that that's one that I think is pretty good. Yeah, you're gonna have to murderous rider that bad boy. Yeah. I mean, but make him have it, right? Like this deck has got no shortage of things that you might have to murderous rider. True. 
You know, Go- Golos is a powerful card that's going to be in on the battlefield the turn after. You know, Kenrith is a powerful card that you can't you can't let them untap with Kenrith if you're planning to play a fair game of Magic, right? So like, what do you what do you think of this deck versus like the Champ Jonathan Rossum's deck, the Bank Golos deck that I think this is like a really good exemplification of the archetype. Um, the primary difference here being uh, Realm Cloaked Giant. Oko Thief of Crowns and Once Upon a Time. Uh, and there's the Arboreal Grazers also. But having that instead of the Fires of Invention package, you know? So it's weird. And Deafening Clarion. Because you can just pick, you know, it's like buffet style, you know, with the Securitas routes and being Sock Giants. You can cast whatever you want, really. Uh, you know, even what Planeswalkers you pick are, are buffet style. This deck happens to play Oko. Other decks happen to play Teferi, for example. Um, why I, does it just, Why don't you do both? I don't know. This deck happens to play Oko. The you know other one happens to play Teferi. Uh, Teferi. If it, if it were up to me, I think I'd start with Rossum's deck and play Teferi instead of Oko, right? Oh, so, I would not cut Oko. Maybe I would you're play right. Both, play both if you want. I think Oko. I think it's still a good time for Oko. First of all, I love Oko. Okay, I'm not. Yeah, you were right. I'm you were not right. anti right Oko. I'm just saying Teferi. I don't know why you hate Yo- Oko so much all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm just saying Teferi is the man in this deck. That's all I'm saying. Um, so this deck has a lot of cards that you want to get resolving, right? And I guess it, 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 we're not at a low point for counter spells, but like. This top eight did not have a lot of counter. We're pretty low. We're pretty so, low. It's pretty hard to play counter spells right now. I really like this deck. I like it more than the uh, than the Fires of Invention version, and I'll tell you why. I think this deck is is, and I think I might even play more Arboreal Grazers. So there's versions that have like three plus Arboreal Grazers, and there are versions that have Risen Reef. I think that you want to have as many Mole Drifter kind of. I got some value, and then I have a garbagey body left thing, while still maintaining kind of the ability to generate that core powerful end game that all of these decks have. Similar, very powerful end games that are either driven by, um, you know, repeated Golos activations or Field of the Dead or both. Right. That as long as you've got that part of the deck going, just the early game stuff and like kind of the mild card advantage stuff the more bodies you can put down i think the better and the reason for that is it creates a huge disincentive for uh doom foretold decks right so like every arboreal grazer is poisoned to a doom foretold deck right it did its job and now this is a permanent that's going to trade for a full turn out of them if you look at the decks that are just only premium permanents right like they don't have cards like arboreal grazer they go straight to fires of invention you're sacrificing something good. That's that's kind of how I see it. Well, it's also just so perfect with Oko, right? If you go turn one Grazer, turn two Oko, and then transform your Grazer into a 3-3 three, three that can attack immediately. I mean, that's actually fantastic, yeah. It that is, is fantastic. Also, Oko, that's, the thing that's crazy to me is Oko gained, right? Isn't oh, that yeah. silly? He gained. Like, I, I feel like he should be going down, but he doesn't go down. Yeah, He's that's so powerful. to ultimate. Yep. Yeah, maybe you're right. We can't cut Oko. He's too good in this deck. I think Oko's messed up. Like, I, what do you think about Realm Cloaked Giant as like kind of the kind of the big papa? Well, I think once you play Once Upon a Time, if you believe in Once Upon a Time, then it kind of takes you down a path because like Once Upon a Time can't find Deafening Clarion, but it can find Realm Cloaked Giant. See, this is this is a deck that uses once upon a time to find sorcery like effects from Beanstalk Giant or Feya Wishes or Realm Cloak Giant, you know, or Gor- Golos for that matter. Um, I don't know. Once upon a time seems fine, um, but I I don't know. I, I I think Realm Cloak Giant is it's a good card. I think the uh, the the inherent card advantage is kind of nice, but I think that. It's not really a grinding format as much as a haymaker go over the top format. And I think Realm Cloak Giant is a little more naturally suited to grinding rather than uh, over the top haymaker. Yeah, I think that this is real interesting. Like when these two decks fight, if both of them just get their mana, right? I think like if one of them doesn't develop its mana early, then that's going to be a big, big strike against. You know, but I, I feel like 
it's tough for this deck to beat the Fires of Invention version in game one. Like I'm looking at this, like, how do they remove a Fires of Invention in game one? Realm Cloak Giant is literally symmetrical, right? This deck has one fewer Kenrith. Um, I think that all the Breakers are in the other deck. No, nah, I don't know, man. Oko's pretty sweet. It is sweet. But, like, in terms of the things that are going to... I mean, I guess I guess you can just be making three threes while gaining a little value every turn. That's a thing you can do. That's cool. Um, I mean, obviously, after sideboarding, uh, the access to Assassin's Trophy and three copies of Agent of Treachery are, are going to be so huge. So uh, one thing to just remember... Uh, Assassin's Trophy has the text destroy target permanent and opponent controls. It doesn't have any qualifiers like non-black creature, anything like that. You can literally just non-land zing zing somebody's field of the dead and uh, that's it. It's it's not not that that's it for their whole strategy, but like if the question is who's going to win in a fight between a deck that's got three field of the dead in play versus one that has four in play, uh, you're going to be on the side of the person who has four field of the dead in play, even if so you, even if the other guy got to search for a forest. So you mentioned uh, yeah, definitely, but you mentioned um, playing Teferi instead of Oko. Are you talking about something like Felix Slew's version that he finished second at the? Uh, they finished second in the classic with a uh, band ramp Golos deck that you know it's got the beanstalk giant fey of wishes run cloak giant that whole thing but then um three arboreal grazers and two to fairy time ravelers with the okos are in the sideboard yeah so this deck is substantially similar in the main deck to the one that we were just looking at has one additional arboreal grazer oddly one fewer beanstalk giant but one more once upon a time uh and you know, it's got basically Teferi instead of Oko. The thing that I like about this deck is that it it it's like it just has more cover. I think that like Teferi is one of the best cover cards that's ever been printed, right? If you get it, you untap with it. Basically, you're guaranteeing yourself that your strategy is going to keep going until they can remove Teferi. Um, obviously, this is a gamble. Like this, these decks are very poorly set up, all of them, for dedicated aggressive strategies. Right, so Arboreal Grazer is a great blocker for one mana, but doesn't really hold up to, to people who are who are planning to remove blockers and, and get in there. But if you're gambling on somebody trying to answer your big spell deck with permission, I think that Teferi is a better option main deck than Oko. So would you go as far as like Isaiah Smithson, who finished ninth in the classic, packing four main deck Teferis and two main deck Agent of Treachery? Um, I don't know. This deck, I mean, you'll note that both of these decks from the classic instead of the decks that we're looking at from the open top four have 29 lands instead of 28. Uh, this deck is, is kind of at odds. Uh, I I think that straight up, if I'm going to play Bant Golos deck against Bant Golos deck, Oko is stronger straight up than Teferi, right? Just 1v1 at the three. Uh, Teferi's better against permission decks, but then you've got like this Agent of Treachery. I guess the bet is if your Teferi doesn't die, the Agent of Treachery will resolve whether you're playing in the mirror match or you're playing against a control deck. That's very, very good for you. And I think that the ability to bounce the Agent of Treachery with Teferi is unreal good. Um, Definitely. That is a thing you can do. Uh, I don't know. Like, it's tough. These decks can literally play whatever they want, right? It's, it, like, well, I'm reminded of every like top the five. Co- yeah, I'm reminded in some ways of a weird portion of the whole Vivid Creek Reflecting Pool experience. Like it's just all costs are available to you if you want. So uh, that was a like the uh, kind of Nasif winning the Pro Tour that that era of uh, Reflecting Pool control. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. Play Cloud Thresher side by side with double white sweepers, Cryptic Command, Volcanic Fallout, uh, Cruel Tomatum, all of it. Yeah, that was. He didn't have Cloud Thresher, but a lot of the decks around that time did. And so, I was thinking about a similar thing, and I think that I'm wrong. Then I was thinking that we had never seen like a legitimate standard where uh, 
play lands, like just play a bunch of lands and then play a bunch of good spells up up the chain remained the best deck throughout the form. Like I couldn't think of one. And I think Nassif winning that Pro Tour is a, there's a strong argument that was the best deck of the, of the format. Well, I think it was the best deck of the format, but I don't think it's fair to describe it as keep winning. Because I think that Fairies was the advantage deck in that format more weeks than Five Color Control was. Because I think that once Five Color Control did, re- like each time Five Color Control did really well, the fairies decks were able to adapt. And I think that it was much easier for fairies to adapt to five color control once they knew what they were up against versus I think the five color control deck, every time it changed, it actually had to continue to be good against everything else also. Whereas fairies would still be incidentally good against most things. Yeah. And then there was actually also the inner, that was also the same time when, the, the red decks with Demigod of Revenge were were uh, present in Standard, right? So that deck was also a really high high performing deck, even if it wasn't as popular as as Fairies. I think and that deck was actually well, think... also excellent okay. against both of those decks. I was going to say that was actually the weird thing is that uh, Mono Red was famous for the only two playable matchups it had were Fairies and Five Card Control. Yeah, those were really good matchups to be good against. <laughs> it was just. <laughs> But it's also funny because every mono red player would talk about how much they beat fairies, and then Paulo would smash half a dozen of them on his way to the top eight. Yeah, I remember. I I was on a Jake Van Lunen still talks about this pizza queue. I was on a roll, but I lost to the same green white guy in in the Swiss, and I lost to him in the top four. <laughs> but man, did that deck beat the heck out of fairies and five color control. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Um, so I, I was just thinking about like what, where is the future of this format that we're in right now? I don't think that we're at this end state where it's just going to be Field of the no, Dead, at all. you know, against Field of the Dead for the next three months. I, I don't well, think how, that's the case. Of course, for sure, for sure. And how do you think that these Field of the Dead decks match up against this new breed of adventure deck that was just running rampant in the classic? Like the champion Aaron Barrick played an example of the Celestia, uh, the the Celestia build, whereas Sean Kimple played uh, an example of the Golgari build. That actually, um, there were three copies of the Golgari in the top eight, and two copies of the Celestia in the top eight, plus another one just outside. So, I I gotta say I was a little sad to see Aaron winning with Celestia, and the reason for that is Aaron played mono red in the main event, didn't didn't make day two. Uh, and then Monterey seems so bad. Yeah. But I mean, Aaron is the player who we go to for the, for the new mono red builds in, in the open series. And well, no, we do, we do. And this is the, and, this, I, I think I agree with him on this build of mono red. <laughs> <laughs> mono red. <laughs> yes. Mono with red in keepers. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that if you splash green for edge wall innkeeper, you might as well play Questing Beast. Like, you know, like Haste pretty good and you're on a red deck, you know. And then if you're looking at the best one drops, a lot of the good one drops that red you used to use uh, rotated out. So I think that um, fleshing out the rest with – like white, for instance, if you add white for stuff like Giant Killer and Fairy Guide Mother, it makes the Edge Wall Innkeeper better and it gives you some more one drops. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I mean, you've got Flax and Intruder even. That's a heck sure. of a one drop. Sure, yeah. And obviously, uh, Love Struck Beast, that's another virtual one drop. It is. So Yeah, uh, and then I and and actually, I mean, at a certain point, right? Like at a certain point, you gotta ask yourself, how many mountains do you really need? That in this I build I, I think I agree with him. I think zero is a good number. <laughs> yeah, so uh, obviously, props to Aaron for uh, finishing first in the classic. Uh, at least we th- would you ca- you would categorize this as an aggro deck, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, certainly it's, aggro relative to other things that are available in the in the format. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Venerated Luxodon is kind of uh, kind of paints a pretty aggro picture. Um, it definitely has an ability to go over the top, though, because you can do things like uh, when you have Edgewall Innkeeper, whenever you cast a creature spell that has an adventure draw card and doesn't need to have gone on the adventure first, you can go uh, 
you can use the usher to safety part of shepherd of the flock, bounce another shepherd of the flock, and then uh, play the shepherd of the flock that you had just uh, exiled to usher the safety. You know, and then you draw a card for each of your edge walling keepers, and then you can repeat. So, like, once you have this going, you can, for every three mana, draw a card for every edge wall innkeeper. And you don't necessarily need to keep rebuying, because you also, if you're drawing any cards that have adventure, you can just keep playing them. So, edge wall innkeeper becomes unbelievable in this deck. It's like a glimpse of nature forever. Yeah. Um, but the obviously, the, the real prize of this deck, I think, is Questing Beast. Questing Beast's ability to just ignore the tokens from Field of the Dead, I think, is makes it extraordinarily attractive in this format. Mm. Okay, no, I can see that. Right, like if if uh, if you look at how a lot of these Golos decks that were performing in the in the main event, they're they've got a lot of stuff that they're doing for the first you know few turns of the game, but. Their end games are predicated on probably triggering that field multiple times per turn, and the beast just kills them right through right through their defense, and even is even back on vigilance to block a, an incoming zombie if need be. Uh, another similar thing: you can use Fairy Guide Mother's Gift of the Fey ability to uh, jump over. You can have your your Venerated Luxodon or Lux, Lovestruck Beast fly over the top of a bunch of 2-2 blockers. Oh, that's awesome. Also, Fairy Guide Mother has some interesting tactical applications. You can point that plus 2 plus 1 at an opponent's creature in order to make it big enough to kill with Giant Killer's Chop Down ability. Oh, that's cool. You know, obviously that's an expensive way to do it, but that's a very useful play for me if you're in spots, and they're going to come up sometimes, but if you're in a spot where your opponent just has an unbelievable creature that's got like two or three power, it's nice to have that extra option as a way to actually solve the problem. I mean, Giant Killer is going to be absolutely, it's just fine against uh, mid-game Crassus, against Giant number one giant number two uh and it can it can hold whoever off uh you know as well as being a, a one drop creature that you play later uh, yeah i don't know i feel like this deck it doesn't feel big to me though right like a lot of Dude, the aggregates... i don't think you've ever had an edge wall innkeeper in play then i've tried it i've drawn i've drawn some cards i've drawn some cards with that card um it's a i guess i haven't played enough unbreakable formations when I'm playing that card, you know, they just play Kaya's Wrath or whatever. But I guess if you got an Unbreakable Formation in your hand... No, but who plays Kaya's Wrath anymore? I, I played against that Esper deck with Doom. Beat uh, me up. I was playing a deck like this last week on on uh, yeah. the Arena event. That seems like a rough matchup. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you have enough of the, uh, of the Unbreakable Formations, they're going to be in trouble. Also, this deck is a great example of a deck that... So many of your cheap guys are giving you value with their adventures that it's okay to just sacrifice them to um, to the Doom Foretold as long as you keep your innkeeper alive, which is obviously a, it's a gamble whether or not that's that's going to happen. Uh, but you know it is it is exciting to me um, that that a deck like this can perform same weekend as as what looked like that Golos dominance. Uh, how how would... see I like the Golgari one. Yeah, I was going to ask you. You like I like the better? Golgari better. Yeah, I like the Golgari direction. Um, so the big thing to me, I think that Rankle, Master of Pranks, is quietly excellent in this deck. I think Questing Beast is is phenomenal, but that's like, I think you hit the nail on the head already. I think all of these decks should play Four Questing Beasts. But I think that once you have Four Questing Beasts, you still want more. And I think that Rankle, Master of Pranks, has some of the the Questing Beast action going on. But it also is a great way to convert some of the extra material you have. You see, you can make people discard cards, which works great when you have Edge Wall Innkeeper and you have all these two for ones. And you can make uh, you can trade in the dorky, you know, the body of the foul mouth knight or the order of midnight or the one one beauty from uh, Heart's Desire. 
Trading those in for like real cards is just excellent. And then having a flying hasty threat, also valuable. Um, the biggest thing I would do different. Oh, and also I, I still just think Murderous Rider is just unbelievable. Oh, that card is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it just takes out stuff of such enormous quality, no matter what it is. Right, it can take out their their awesome guy. It can take out their awesome walker. It, yeah, I also just like find finality. I think find finality as a way to clean up tokens if it goes that way, but as a way to continue to two for one. Like you got to be careful because uh, you're not going to beat the ramp decks that way. But I think you got to have a plan for beating everybody else. And I think that Fine Finality can stack with a bunch of these other cards to give you a real powerful advantage against the non-ramp decks. Uh, I think this deck is really well set up to fight against the ramp decks. First of all, main deck Legion Dend um, is a very good way to to clean up 2-2 zombie tokens. I just don't think that it's really about the 2-2 zombie tokens that much, though, is it? Isn't it just so much more about uh, Golos? I mean... It could be about Golos, right? Like Golos is a slow card against this deck, though. That's true. Or, like that, it's not that Golos stinks or anything. Golos never stinks, but it's you know, it, it's just like it, it doesn't even win fights. You know, like it, Golos can't beat Foulmire Knight in a fight. Golos can't beat Lovestruck Beast in a fight. You know, Golos can't beat Murderous Rider because it doesn't get there, right? Murderous Rider takes Golos out before it gets there. Order of Midnight flies over Golos. Now, what about this deck versus the Fires of Invention, though? Excuse me? Sorry? The Fires of Invention, though, man. If you play against one of those people, that goes way over the top of this deck. Oh, well, that's, yeah. I mean, that's different. But the thing is, this deck has got three Assassin's Trophy in the main deck also. Right? So, um, the I think the Assassin's Trophy is going to be it's going to be real valuable it can destroy fires of invention it's a main deck way to deal with fires of invention itself as we know that deck is heavily reliant on having fires of invention in play to do some of its craziest mischief can you imagine if you go like go like fires of invention use fae of wishes go get nickel bolus right that's that's the play that they make for sake of argument right and then you're like all right assassin's trophy or fires of invention they can't even cast the nickel bolus anymore like, no matter what they search for, there's not enough black in their deck. So, like, I think, like, that's pretty well, cool. Well, but, but hold on. How, why are they still getting the Nico Bolas? I'm just saying if they do that, right? So if they're, like, they granted for the, for Nico, just as an example. Well, no, but why, like, where, when are you casting Assassin's Trophy? Like, on, on their turn after they use the granted? Why, why do you have priority? Are you talking about in response to the granted? No, you let them cast the granted. Okay, then they just have priority. Uh, I'm saying if they played Fires of Invention and granted in the same turn, right? So they can't cast a third spell. Oh, so you're just saying if it's just immediately. Yeah, because yeah. normally you don't play granted until the turn you're going to go where you play whatever else. Yeah, I, I think it just depends on what you've got, right? Like if, they, if they've got something else to do, they're obviously going to do that. that. That might affect the battlefield a little bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes. you, you might be able to. I wouldn't. I wouldn't focus too hard on trying to strand them. But yeah, you might get them sometime. I think. I think like the fact that this deck has like a pretty good medium level of like card advantage and so forth in the middle turns, and then can cut off their end game. Right, Legion's End blunts their end game pretty good, and Assassin's Trophy is great against their end game. Um, and I mean, for that matter, Fine Finality is great against their end game. Uh, I think like this deck is really well set up for those kind of opponents. And then the sideboard's pretty good. I think, like, Veil of Summer is going to be really important. Hmm. Why can't we play with any cards that cost two? Do we play in the second turn? I mean, there's all these cards that cost two that we don't play in the second turn. But why can't we play cards on the second turn? Which ones do you want to play? I I don't know, man. There's got to be something worth playing, right? There is a really good card to play on the second turn, but neither of these aggro decks can play it. Uh, But uh, if... but uh, like a Simic based aggro deck would, would be great in that deck. Is the the guy from Corset 2020, he's a one and a G for a 2 2 when you make a token, he gets plus one plus one. That deck, uh, that, that card rather, I think it'd be, is going to be a really good aggro card. Uh, but we, you know, the, the deck for him hasn't been revealed in one of these two tournaments. Because uh, like if you're just pumping out 
food tokens with Oko or Gilded Goose. That guy's just going to get huge. And then you, what other other token stuff that you've got going on? He's just going to get huge. And everybody's going to be pointing their removal at your other stuff because it's so good. And he's just going to be a 7-7 seven, seven or something. Hmm. You know which guy I'm talking about? What's his name? Yeah. That is a good card to play on turn two. Charming Prince, excellent card that you might play on turn two. But like you said, that's a card that yes. you could play on turn two, but probably won't. I don't know. It's like, that card yeah. is too good to play on turn two. <laughs> But hey, I I don't know. If you're playing against aggro, you just gain some life, or you need to make your next land drop. He can help you with that. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's going to be the key to these decks is figuring out a good two mana play, um, that that actually works with the rest of the deck. But uh, or at least the the Golgari deck is going to need that. Um, other other aggro decks could play uh, can play cards on turn two, like uh, the mono red aggro deck. Uh, no, the... I know, I know, I know. I just mean this deck. This deck oh, just doesn't okay. have two drops in it. Yeah. Just have to play the one drops on turn two. and. But don't play Mono Red, dude. Mono Red is horror bad. Uh, Simic Flash, dude. A deck after both of our hearts. I love Simic Flash. What do you think of Raphael's uh, Simic Flash list? So, the fourth place deck... Um, this deck is echoing what you were talking about a few weeks ago with... Uh, only three copies of Frilled Mystic, but I don't know if I can get behind four copies of Once Upon a Time 2 Opt. Once Upon a Time <laughs> was, like, really underperforming for me when I played this played it in this strategy. Uh, the other card that was underperforming for me was Brazen Borrower. And I still think you have to play a bunch of Brazen Borrower. It was just not as good as I thought it was going to be. The card I would definitely play four copies of that are only three in this deck, Wildborn Preserver. How are there only three copies? That's, like, one of the best cards and I don't know if I can get behind twenty two land. These the, these are well, my... I can. It, once you if you're in the world where you're literally playing for once upon a time and two opt, then I think twenty two land is fine. But I think if you cut some of the once upon a times, you should have land. This deck does not have any fabled passage. Are you for real? Wow. I don't know if that's I... wrong. I just think it's like surprising. Yeah, I feel like I would play fabled passage. Same. It was like the first card I put in my list. But maybe this is right. Um, I, I mean, mean, Matt Nast didn't play any Fable Passage either. His Simic deck, it wasn't a Simic Flash deck per se, but it did have Brazen Borrower. But Simic, Matt Nast's list was actually pretty interesting over in the uh, the team open. Um, he was the only person to top eight with, obviously, you know, world renowned deck builder, but the only person to top eight without uh, a Golos deck. Uh, it was like a Gilded Goose Paradise Druid ramp deck, right, of sorts. But it's not really even a ramp deck. It's a tap-out deck. It's one of these Nissa Who Shakes the World decks. It just happened to use four Wicked Wolf and four Questing Beast. Uh, I'm into this deck. This is the deck I think that if I were just going to play a tournament tomorrow, I'd probably play this deck. Um, it, this deck's it, got four Gilded Goose and four Oko in the main deck to produce... Uh, food and it uses those food uh you know to to make wicked wolf good uh it's got questing beasts to attack into two two creatures uh it's got brazen borrower for tempo and flying and then it's just got it's got like the it, it's funny because we're in a in a format of actual fairy godmother and this deck has what i think of as the fairy godmother of standard Untapping with Nissa in play and then just casting Hydra and Crassus and crossing your fingers. <laughs> this deck can do that. Happy to, to sleeve it up. Uh, I, I mean, I happen to really like the whole turn one Gilded Goose, turn two Oko. Oh, yeah. Opening. That's pretty brutal. And then Wicked Wolf obviously gets a lot better. If you have four Gilded Goose and four Oko in your deck, then uh, Wicked Wolf is like a pretty serious threat. I I remember the first week when we were when we knew about Wicked Wolf and Questing Beast and you were like Team Questing Beast and I was like Team Wicked Wolf. I I'm actually very happy that Wicked Wolf and Questing Beast are just they're like we're both on all these teams. <laughs> Four of me. Well, I don't know. Questing Questing Beast is on a few more teams. For what it's worth, Wicked Wolf is you on know, some teams. No big deal. Wicked Wolf is on some teams. <laughs> He's got without questing beast. He's got he's got some slots. I, I'm sure I could falsify a without Wikipedia entry and, and, okay. and link you to there it. You go. There we go. 
so do you, I think you like the Matt Nass style better than the Simic Flash uh, that like Raphael yeah, played? Yeah, if I were gonna if I were gonna play in a tournament tomorrow, and I was and I'd probably play a deck that had Breeding Pool to be clear. I think I would just play uh, maybe not exactly the seventy five, but a deck like this. Um, I like for example, I don't get Love Struck Beast in the sideboard of this deck. It doesn't make a lot <laughs> no. of sense to me. No, uh, I, don't I might that. be wrong, right? Uh, I think that if I were gonna play Love Struck Beast in the sideboard. Uh, I would consider playing the uh, forecasting cost Vivian. You know that one that like puts plus one plus one counters or. Well, like, no. So I I actually love Love Struck Beast here, for what it's worth. Like I I think you might be, um, like are you you're considering the whole beast can block regardless of if you have a one. Oh yeah. That's the whole point. Is that you can play a one one and that's dope, and then you play a five five blocker. So we're just like using the beast to just gum up the battlefield while oh I guess and you're like defending your future Nissa with it. Yeah, I mean you're that. you're like it's what's the red deck gonna do? You I played a one one early on too, right? I think we have established what the red deck is gonna do. It's gonna <laughs> put the zero next to how many wins that it's got, and then it's gonna totally. it's gonna go register for the side draft. Um, but I, I think- uh, did you see? Oh, go ahead, please. I just, I just want to play Henge. Like, <laughs> I just love Henge. I think this is a good Henge deck. Right? There's a lot of, you know, mid mid expensive, powerful creatures that can line up Henge. But I guess it's it's actually here's my here's my thing. Should this deck have some number of copies of Castle Garenbrig? I think I don't know if that's an oversight, but like I think Castle Garenbrig is good in this deck. What do you think? Oh, that's interesting. I'd have to see. I mean I don't know. I, if you don't have, like, a ton of mana, are you sure you're getting enough mileage out of it? Because it's so important to not miss uh, your early development. I mean, he doesn't even have Fabled Passage. Not uh, wanting land to ever be tapped. I think that Fabled Passage is different than Castle Garenbrig of this deck. I just think that the extra oomph you get out of Castle Garenbrig for purposes of Krasis, and also in the mid-game, you know, you might just be getting some value in the same turn. You're like, all right, six... And off of five lands, you're like beast and you can, or here's an example. You can goose activation and wolf so that you have an extra food in play for the wolf. Right? That's something the Castle Garenbrake can help you out with. Yeah, but Castle Garenbrake doesn't even give you mana from Nissa either. That's true. That's true. So in games where Nissa is in play, you don't need any extra mana. Like Nissa is Nissa. Well, but it's negative one compared to that. Well, no, hey, I'm just hey, saying, actually, like, it, it's, an, it's an argument to not play Castle and Garenbrig. As far as Nissa decks go, there's a spicy one in the classic, Craig Rocco's Teamer one. This has Gilded Goose Questing, Beast, Brazen Borrower, Nissa, Oko, etc. But it also has the Royal Scions. The Royal Scions. So this deck has a boatload of Planeswalkers. 15 Planeswalkers. And the, so it's got Oko, Thief of Crowns, very exciting three. It's got Nissa Who Shakes the World, very exciting five. Domri, Anarch of Bolas is just there, right? The Royal Science, like you said. But I think the man, the shirtless wizard who brings it all together, Sark and the Masterless, all of a sudden, we're putting something together here. All these Planeswalkers are not only getting in the, into the red zone, but they're getting in the red zone with five power because of Domri. So does the Royal Scions do enough here? Uh, I, I need the Royal Scions. Huh. I saw the Royal Scions <laughs> be awesome today when I was watching some, watching some stream, but this deck does not have any of the cards that made the Royal Scions look good. Uh, you can make your already pretty good guy bigger. That's a thing. The thing that's great about the Royal Science is it has such an enormous starting loyalty. Five starting loyalty for three. That's good. Right? If you're like first turn Arboreal Grazer, second turn the Royal Scions, you can rumble and and you've got like a ton of loyalty. Uh, the thing that's weird to me is this deck has one copy of Once Upon a Time and it's got two copies of Bone Crusher Giant and four copies of Brazen Borrower. Isn't that a thing you would want? Right? Once Upon a Time to get Bone Crusher Giant for purposes of the removal side, is too 
too, too good, right? There's only two copies of that and one copy of Once Upon a Time. I don't know. Maybe it's a card availability thing, Patrick. Like, maybe this deck is, like, uh, I hate mode. jumping to assuming that. I mean, uh, some of this stuff doesn't uh, make any sense to me, though. One copy of Once Upon a Time and two copies of Bone Crusher Giant, I don't get it. Well, I mean, what does Bone Crusher Giant even kill in the format? Mm. So Gruel Aggro. Dude, so Randy Ball playing a uh, a different take on red. This is like basically a red green monsters deck. The sort of deck that has two different types of Domries in it, right? <laughs> to say nothing of Domries Ambush. But this is a questing beast deck with four Bone Crusher Giant. But it's a it's a Pelt Collector Robber of the Rich deck, and then it's got Once Upon a Time in this aggro deck, and it's got four main deck Flame Sweeps, two main deck Veil of Summers, and three Domri's Ambush. I don't know about this. Like this seems like heavily biased to me, right? Like Flame really. Sweep- you think four main deck flame sweeps and two main deck Veil of Summers is heavily yeah, biased? That's pretty odd for an aggro deck. Right? Like, I mean, granted, it's got to be a mistake. It's got to be a mistake, though. Oh, there's four flame sweeps in the sideboard, also. There's no way. Yeah, so yeah, I think okay. it's actually just the four flame sweeps are actually just part of the sideboard, and so are the two Veil of Summers. Okay. Like, that's, but that's you know, not possible. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way. However, uh, this deck still looks kind of, I mean, they're powerful cards and stuff, but I just don't know why I would want to do this instead of, like, if you're just playing as somebody who just fay of wishes for any one of a million sweepers, aren't they going to just get you good? No, it's not that bad. First of all, like you said, this deck has two copies of Domri, two types of Domri, right? So if they if they get you with, like, a sweeper, oftentimes you're still going to have somebody left. And it also depends which sweeper they get, right? Uh, Questing Beast, Scargan Hellkite. And many versions of like uh, Gruel Spellbreaker and Pelt Collector are going to live through uh, Deafening Clarion. The other thing is that this deck is just mono haste. Like with the exception of Bone Crusher Giant, every creature in this, uh, I guess Pelt Collector, almost every creature in this deck has got some some proxy haste ability. Meaning that like, sure, you sweep me, you time wipe me, whatever. I'm going to come back over for x the next turn could be five uh so i think it's okay like you just don't overcommit. Mm, okay it's interesting uh i mean i'm just always a little like heady heady scratchy scratchy when i look at aggro decks that are playing like a lot of main deck lava coil and domery's ambush kind of cards instead of cards that can hit face um but maybe that's what's contextually appropriate to this format i just I I don't know that I can buy that Lava Coil is better than, you know, you know, some smaller burn maybe that that can that can hit players in a deck like this. Like, I think that I think that a lot of the problem that a deck like this is going to have is that it comes out fast. It can get the opponent relatively low. They stabilize in the exact same way you're saying, right? They're going to fail wishes for a sweeper. And then you got to finish them outside of the red zone. Sec is going to have a hard time doing that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also just doesn't have as powerful of cards per mana. Um, yeah, but that's my biggest issue with it is that. Yeah. Do you think that the Simic deck that Matt played is uh, on par power level to the Dom uh, to the uh, Golos decks, or do you think it's actually a, a tier below on power level? Uh, I think it's the if you just look at the quality of cards. I mean. So the cards in Matt Nass's deck, one of the nice things about this versus some of the other Simic decks is it doesn't have cards like Quel- Quench that are, like, so weak. Yeah. Nissa Who Shakes the World, Questing Beast, Wicked Wolf, Hydroid Crassus, Gilded Goose, Brazen Borrower, Oko. Once a- I mean, he's got powerful cards. Yeah, those are all hits, right? Those are all right, like if the weakest top 20 card cards deck- in the format. Well, they can't all be, but, yeah, they're pretty high up there. But, like, if the weakest card in your deck is Paradise Druid, your average power level is pretty high. So I that's one of the reasons I like Matt Nass's deck is I just think he's just playing better cards than a lot of these other decks. Do you want something uh, like an agent of treachery or even a, a mass manipulation on the top end? 
No, no, I think you can't. I mean, maybe it comes to that eventually, but I think you're going to have to be faster. I don't think you can realistically go over the top of the ramp decks. You're just not going to be able to be, get big enough. They're, they're so much more committed to the going big plan. So, like, um, then this sec has to have a tempo breaker, right? It has to it have, does. like, a permission spell. Maybe. Brazen Borrower did really good work for him. But mostly, he was just okoing people into next Tuesday. Uh, there is one more deck I wanted to touch on before we had to, before we have to duck out, and that's the mono black deck. That um, there's two different styles of it that are uh, a witches of and apart. Over in the team open, so Chase Masters played the uh, the non oven version. This is a mono black aggro deck. It's like sixty percent, you know, mono black aggro, forty percent kind of a mono black aristocrats deck though. You know, like it's got. Uh, Gutter Bones, Knight of the Evan Legion for some pretty good one drops. Footlight Fiend for some more one drops, and then it's got uh, it's got a whole Priest of Forgotten Gods as a really attractive two mana play. Um, Spawn of Mayhem, Ayara. So uh, all these one guys with thing, the Spawn though, of Mayhem no removal. instead of that Knight that you like, right? Everybody's got that Spawn. Yeah, I mean, well, insofar as nobody has any blockers and there's no fighting, the extra damage a turn is uh, pretty solid. You know? Uh, yeah, so there's no removal. I guess. Priest yeah, you're just playing Murderous Rider and Rankle. Priests of Forgotten Gods to a degree also, but part of it is just not playing with any dead removal spells. Uh, after Cyborg, you've got Disfigure. Legions, only a couple of Legions end, actually. I guess you can't over-sideboard with this deck. It doesn't let you. The uh, the other version, um, Marquise Johnson played a version with four Witches Ovens um, to power the Cauldron Familiar thing for some reach with the exotic top end of Gruesome Menagerie. Oh, wow. Gruesome Menagerie is a card. I haven't seen this since, like, grand prix almost a year ago uh it is exciting right so you can potentially return uh a bunch of stuff for for one spell but i guess you can set it up with cauldron i'm sorry with uh with witches oven yourself though it's not hard to do um i i gotta say i like the other deck better uh the one thing that i'd say it's odd about both of these decks is that both of them are like kind of value focused uh, investing in Orzov Enforcers. So there's two copies of Orzov Enforcer in this deck, and then there were four copies of Orzov Enforcer in Chase Master's deck, and neither of them played four copies of Order of Midnight. I feel like Order of Midnight is like one of the higher quality cards you could be playing. Uh, see, I really like Order of Midnight, but I actually am not sure that you need to play so many of them right now with how little removal people are playing. If you look at the 14th place version, which is another No Cauldron version, James Buckingham's Mono Black deck, um, again, no removal, but he does have four drill bits, so a little bit of a departure there. But uh, he's actually not even... He's playing Black Lance Paragon instead of any Order of Midnights. Now, I would play Order of Midnights also, but like I think Black Lance Paragon, it does an interesting quasi-removal impression in spots. But this is just another version demonstrating how much Order of Midnight isn't the backbone of this particular archetype right now, anyway, with how little removal people are playing. Like, don't you think, like, if you're going to play your own copies of Rankle, that, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just completely way off. I will just shout out to you. Lazotep Reaver is in this deck. You Remember you, oh, had, yeah. that, you had that hot take that Lazotep Reaver is going to be a more significant... Um, army making card than the than the bitter blossom card. Uh, yeah, looks, looks like you're right because Lazatep Reaver. What's the strong card? Obviously. Deck. Yeah, I mean, if you just play with, like, if you just look at it, like, obviously, I mean, if you don't care about rate, then or winning, then obviously the other card's cute. But like, <laughs> all right, you don't dude. Care about winning. What's your favorite deck of the week, man? Uh, I, I said I'd play Matt's deck. I like it a lot. Yeah, uh, I like Matt's deck too. That would be my my deck of the week, but that also might be partly because first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, all go us. Yeah, I just I it's just for me if I could play a deck that is still competitive, but I just I don't 
it's not that I don't think I could learn to navigate these long, long games that are like uh, Field of Ruin. I'm sorry, Field of the Dead playing against Field of the Dead. I just kind of don't want to right now. Right. If that's the best thing that like if I were about to play in the Mythic Championship and this is the this is the only way that that I'd be playing the best strategy, then I'd, I'd probably try to learn that strategy. But if I'm just going to, you know, want to play and I'm going to play FNM or I'm going to I'm going to grind some arena, I would just rather not. I, don't, I would rather that not be the definition of my of my experience playing. Dude, you've come so far. You used to be such a win, win, win. But now, I think that now his deck is good. <laughs> It's not a bad deck. (laughs) All right, dude. Uh, I'll see you next week. All right. Goodbye, guys. Bye-bye. Pussy life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge into jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis. Lost so 